Thank you for joining today's webcast entitled Demystifying Operational Due Diligence, Due for a Change. My name is Hank Kim and I'm NCPERS Executive Director. Today's program is part of our Center for Online Learning, which provides remote continuing education to public pension trustees, staff, and other fiduciaries and stakeholders. The impact of COVID-19 on investment and operational due diligence efforts have been a common topic among institutional investors, investment managers, and investment consultants. Initial conversations at the outset of the pandemic were rightly focused on whether firms were successful in implementing business continuity and disaster recovery plans. In this webcast, we'll discuss current ODD practices and how they should evolve in this new environment. We will share insights from a practitioner's lens and look at answers uh, and look to answer any questions that public fund clients may have. Leading us in our discussion, we have with us from Aon, Ryan Aki and Chris Vasilopoulos. Ryan is the global head of Aon's operational risk solutions and analytic group. He joined Aon in 2015. Ryan is responsible for developing and implementing operational risk identification and reduction strategies across Aon's global client portfolios, which have exposure to thousands of investment managers globally across all asset classes. Chris is a senior consultant at Aon and has a public fund focus, as well as being dedicated to the ORSA platform. He markets the firm's asset management and advisory solutions to institutions and works with clients in the relationship management capacity. We want to make this session interactive as always. So please submit your questions by using the Q&A function on this platform. And at the end of the formal presentation, we will uh, address your questions. So with that, Chris, I'll turn over the webcast to you and Ryan. Great, thank you, Hank. I uh, really appreciate it and thank you to everyone who's taking the time to join us today. Uh, we're very excited to talk to you about operational due diligence. We're gonna talk about some of the history of ODD, how it's traditionally been conducted, and how we believe the process can actually be improved. And once again, my name is Chris Vasilopoulos and I work in a business development capacity here at Aon. And my associate and the person who'll be doing the lion's share of the speaking today is Ryan Aki. And Ryan's a partner and also again, as Hank mentioned, the global head of our operational risk solutions and analytics group, and we call that ORSA. About six years ago, we were fortunate enough to have Ryan join us. Uh, he's a 15 plus year veteran in ODD. And uh, when he arrived, he was actually given a clean slate to create a better mousetrap when it comes to uh, ODD. And we really believe he's accomplished this feat. And uh, he's gonna discuss today how he was able to do this. And in a nutshell, He's taken a traditionally laborious, expensive, and subjective exercise and made it much more streamlined, affordable, and most importantly, objective and empirical. He's actually been able to create a quantitative complement to a traditionally qualitative process. And without further ado, I want to kick it over to Ryan. Ryan, please take it away. Great, thanks. Chris, thanks Hank for the introductions there. Just a quick confirm that you can see my screen and hear me okay. Um, Chris with a thumbs up there. All right, cool. Thank you um, everyone for joining us today. Um, so most of the, the session will kind of talk a little bit about um, kind of the ODD program um, and kind of classic approaches to operational due diligence. Uh, we'll talk a little bit then about how uh, maybe the world has changed in the last 15 to 20 years since um, ODD work became more and more commonplace. And then we'll talk a little bit about um, a data-driven approach and how we think uh, that has some capabilities in terms of improving outcomes, uh, making more sophisticated and consistent kind of assessments of investment managers and their operations. Um, that's kind of the, the lay of the land in terms of what we'll talk about today. Um, I appreciate you having us here. Um, I know there's opportunities to ask questions, so do feel free uh, to ask questions. Um, we can hopefully intersperse some of those uh, throughout the discussion um, or circle back at the end to make sure we're kind of covering off all the things that you might be curious about. So I thought I would start, you know, I, I know a lot of folks have familiarity with operational due diligence, but I thought I would start with a little bit of a background on that. 
um, at kind of a one-on-one -on -one level, just to make sure, you know, we're kind of all on the same page before we get into um, talking about some of the more complex subjects that we'll think about here today. Um, but when we, you know, at Aon say that we have conducted an operational due diligence review, um, these are kind of the topics that we cover. So you can see, uh, you know, there's eight different um, uh, core topics that we're focused on here. Um, I think, you know, some groups may call them something a little bit different. They, they may split them into, you know, additional categories or something like that. This is how we name them and how we bundle them. Um, and I think generally, uh, again, even if other folks have a different kind of number of topics or call them something different, I think really ODD is coalesced around these areas. This is what we cover generally when we think about a firm's operations. So it's everything from the corporate and organizational structure of the firm um, to their technology program and platform, um, which would include cybersecurity, for example, um, to their vendor management, so how they're picking and selecting and monitoring their key service providers. So it's really a, a pretty broad uh, platform, a pretty broad content area that we cover. Um, and again, I think you know, for a good comprehensive uh, operational due diligence uh, function, I, I think this is pretty consistent with what most uh, groups ultimately will be covering. Um, one thing to know is, is really, you know, this framework is adaptable to most any asset class. Um, that doesn't mean we look at the exact same things for every asset class, um, but we look at them in the context of what that asset class is doing. Um, so whether you're trading in public equities or fixed income securities, or whether it's a private markets type of strategy like private equity or venture capital, um, we're still kind of looking at the same areas, just with a little bit of a different lens and context. So it's really meant to be um, a, a, a global uh, approach as well. Uh, we can cover managers based in any region. Um, we can cover managers in any asset class. Um, so this is uh, a little bit about the overall topics we cover. And then we wanted to drill a little bit into um, what, do, what does that mean? So, so for one of those eight categories, for example, here, corporate and organizational structure, here's some high level bullet points um, that we are thinking about as we do an assessment of a firm's corporate and organizational structure. Um, the idea here is, you know, we want to understand, you know, who and how decisions are made. Um, we want to understand the organizational structure of the firm, um, how duties are segregated, um, how, you know, the firm is ensuring that they're hiring kind of competent staff, that they have enough staff, those types of things. Um, we want to understand control of the firm and does that rest with, you know, a key person, for example. And if so, what are the risks associated with that? What happens if that person is no longer around or available? We want to think about how a firm is ultimately hiring talent um, and, and keeping that talent from leaving. Um, so how, what do they do? What are their retention programs and strategies? And then things like background checks. Um, how are they ensuring, how are they thinking about new employees or existing employees in terms of their own backgrounds and making sure that they're not hiring folks that have maybe bad um, regulatory or litigation histories or criminal backgrounds and things like that. So these are the high level bullet points. And then I kind of like to use the slide as an example to make sure folks understand, you know, that ODD work is, is relatively granular. We're not making a uh, 5,000 foot view um, kind of take the temperature, test the wind direction of the corporate and organizational structure. Um, we actually have very specific types of risks that we are considering and looking at. Um, so at Aon, we keep something called a risk inventory. So each one of those eight categories um, that we first talked about has its own list of specific risk types that we think about as part of an overall review. Here you can see in the corporate and organizational structure, for example, in that area, there's 30 different risk types that we are thinking about. Now, we're not going to go through these. It's really meant to be illustrative. Uh, but the idea here, again, is to kind of reinforce uh, the concept that what ODD does is, is relatively granular. Um, it's regimented. Uh, it's, a, it's a program. <laughs> there's a process involved. So um, depending on, call it the asset class that we're looking at, um, because there may be different risk factors for each asset class, or the structure of the investment, um, which typically means, you know, whether it's in a commingled fund or in a managed account, 
Um, the overall risk inventory across the eight categories that we look at is between 170 and 260 different risks. Um, so call it on average two, 200 or so different risks that we're thinking about. Um, and so, you know, as uh, you think about your own kind of operational due diligence program or monitoring exercises, um, it's a way to kind of think about, you know, what you're focused on, what you're looking on. There are a lot of things to think about. Um, and again, that, that risk inventory that we keep is, is pretty um, intense. It changes all the time. Um, we used to say that we updated once a year, and I guess maybe officially we do, um, but it's even more dynamic um, than that because there's always new risks that are emerging. There's new things that our clients care about. And so we're always kind of receptive to, to understanding what's going on in the marketplace that may be introducing new types of risks to think about. So that's a pretty live document for us in terms of the types of things that we ultimately consider. I'm gonna shift gears here a little bit and <clears throat> move ahead to the types of risks that we think about. Um, so again, pretty classically, um, you know, hopefully uh, folks understand this, um, but we'll explain it in a little bit more detail. Um, but the idea with operational due diligence is, is we think about all of the things that are not investment risk. Um, so, you know, buying the wrong um, stock, um, at least from a, a selection standpoint, um, is, is more of an investment risk or kind of macroeconomic conditions and changes in the market. Those are very much investment risk types of things. Um, to think about. And we have an entire staff at Aon, uh, we have something like 50 different investment researchers that are responsible for picking the best hedge fund strategies or the best private equity managers. Um, and they're really focused on the investment risk and how the investment program is implemented at the manager. The idea here for my group and for ODD folks uh, more broadly is that we're looking at everything else. We're looking at how they run their business. We want to uh, find a way to limit opportunities for losses that aren't associated with investment risk, but are operational in nature. Um, the, the four, you know, there's four types of risks, or at least we categorize the types of risks that we think about in four different ways. Um, the top two, the susceptibility to fraud, the susceptibility to blow up. You know, these are the, the ones that I really think ODD started with as a discipline. So if you go back 15, 20 years when kind of ODD was really emerging um, as a separate discipline, a lot of that was focused on the hedge fund space and it was focused on these really kind of bad outcomes. Um, so folks who have been in the industry a long time will remember uh, events like long-term capital, um, we all certainly remember, you know, the Madoff fraud, but there were other kind of hedge fund fraud situations that uh, existed or that took place even before that financial crisis. And so ODD work really began as a way kind of to prevent and focus on those top two risk areas. Those are the really big catastrophic outcomes that, of course, everyone wants to avoid. Um, so again, we're looking for environments that are potentially susceptible to fraud, susceptible to blow up. That's typically a situation in a leverage strategy, right, where the financing um, gets up to upside down effectively and you have a, a portfolio that's worth less than, than the assets in it. Um, we also more and more um, are looking at things like reputational risk. So that's the dark blue box, the third one down. Um, so again, uh, having an event where there's publicity associated with it that's negative um, and the downstream implications that are associated uh, with that or the potential for business deterioration. And then on the lower left, um, we have something that we call alpha degeneration. Um, so for us, alpha degeneration, um, I think has probably emerged a little bit more in the last five to 10 years as a focus uh, for ODD. But these are um, lower level risks that individually uh, or in isolation don't necessarily result typically in a catastrophic outcome. Um, but these are the things that could cost a basis point here and there. Um, so it's slippage type things associated with a poor kind of operating environment that may take your return from say 10% to 9.9 to .9 or something like that. So losing 10 basis points because of some kind of operational sloppiness. These are really difficult, um, I think, ultimately to, to value, um, but they're, they're very, very much present. And so one of the things, I'll go back to Chris's original comment, you know, when I started at Aon, we built the program, the ODD program, not as a commercial um, 
kind of consulting service. We really were built as an internal risk reduction group. I think that's very different than a lot of the consulting, um, ODD consulting groups um, have been kind of formed and established a different purpose. Um, it really gave us a chance to look at not what is the marketplace buying, uh, but what is the best way to think about and address and remediate some of the risks that we find. And so the reason I mentioned that is when we think about alpha degeneration risks, we go back to that risk inventory I was talking about earlier. Um, we actually map you know, each of those factors to the type of risk that's presented. And what we find is that between 65 and 70% of the risks that we're thinking about fall into that alpha degeneration bucket. Um, now that's not inherently a problem or bad. Other than this, as a risk manager, my concern becomes this. Are we spending two thirds of our time on the lowest level risks? And isn't that kind of the opposite of what you want it to be? Don't you want to kind of optimize your resource allocation toward the more critical risks? Um, so we still feel a need um, to cover them. They're important. Uh, many times um, smaller risks kind of action together in concert to create a bigger risk. So you can't ignore them. Um, but I think you really need to be in a position to think about um, you know, your time allocation and commitment to uh, lower level risks versus the more critical risks. That's a big underpinning of my thinking. We'll talk a little bit more about it later. Um, but wanted to introduce that concept. But these are the kinds of non-investment risks that we think about and how we bucket them. Um, just also wanted to spend a minute uh, clarifying a little bit about what we don't do um, and what uh, operational due diligence generally isn't accomplishing. Um, so firstly, we're not an audit function. Um, so, you know, probably a lot of folks are familiar with something called internal controls testing. Um, so stock one or maybe an SSA E18. That's when an, uh, an investment manager hires a firm to come in and audit their policies and procedures. So they're auditing how they're actually implemented. Are they being, you know, consistently executed? Um, are there gaps? Are there problems? So audit is more of a forensic testing. Um, they're forming an opinion on whether a policy and procedure is implemented correctly, is implemented consistently. Our role comes at the front of that. We actually aren't testing the implementation. We are forming a judgment on whether it's a good policy or procedure to begin with. Um, so that's a little bit of the trade-off here. We come in on the front end, we form an opinion of whether it's a good policy, it's a good procedure, it's sound, um, it's a well-controlled, it creates a well-controlled operating environment. But an audit firm is gonna actually test the implementation. The audit firm generally isn't forming an opinion of whether it's a good policy or procedure to begin with. Um, certain times they will, if it's a particularly egregious um, gap or something like that, but for the most part, um, there's not a huge kind of nuanced assessment of the policies and procedures from an audit firm. Um, the second box is kind of legal review. We always want to make sure folks understand, um, you know, that we are not uh, a, a replacement for legal advice. Um, there's currently nobody on my team, in fact, who is a, a JD. Um, that said, all of us uh, on my team have read hundreds, thousands of offering documents over the years. Um, we understand them from an operational perspective, um, but we can't form an opinion. We can't provide advice on you know, specific things like, I don't know, the taxation in a specific domicile for a specific client type or something like that. So there are things from time to time um, that absolutely and, and quite, kind of quite honestly always require a separate legal review um, as opposed to what we do in terms of the operational review. We wanna make sure folks understand that as well. And then the last piece on the right hand side, you know, again, there's a difference in investment due diligence and operational due diligence. Um, some of the ways I, you know, like to explain this or think about this um, in a trading environment, for example, if a manager is trading equities, um, every, everything up to the point where they make a decision to buy a specific quantity uh, or a, a specific name or stock, that's, that's investment process. So our investment researchers are gonna really kind of focus on that and, and make a judgment about whether that's a good process, whether it's replicable, those types of things. However, once that, once that decision has been made, then it becomes operational. So how do they implement that decision? And what are the controls around that? So that's, for example, that's, that, that, that's one way we differentiate kind of ODD work from investment 
due diligence. Another one would be in the risk management side. Um, so we think of you know, investment risk and oversight. Um, a lot of times we think about it this way. Um, the investment folks are um, assessing the what. You know, what are they doing? Uh, you know, what ratios are they looking at? Uh, what are they comparing? What are they using um, and, and, and thinking about from a risk management standpoint? Our focus in the risk management oversight is more about who and how. Um, so who's responsible for it? And is it somebody who is appropriately segregated from the portfolio management team, uh, for example? And then how is it implemented? Um, are there controls around risk reporting? Is it generated independently from the front office or the portfolio management teams? How do you segregate that to make sure that somebody isn't trying to hide or obfuscate something that's going on. So those are just a couple of examples. And again, we want to make sure folks know what we do, uh, but we also want to make sure people know what we don't do. Um, and again, I think most of this is, is pretty standard. I don't think this is unique to Aon. I think this is uh, kind of how ODD as a discipline ultimately uh, has evolved uh, again over the last 15 to 20 years. And next, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about that evolution. Uh, I'll take a quick pause here. Um, just to see Hank or Chris if any questions have come in, um, uh, and if not, I'll go into the next section. Okay. Ryan? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, uh, there are no questions at this point. Okay, no problem. So we'll continue here. We'll talk a little bit about the evolution. Um, I keep kind of focusing on, you know, roughly 15 years ago, uh, you know, kind of when ODD started as a discipline. Um, probably a little bit before that, um, but there's, there's this kind of famous quote we, we see a lot in conference settings um, or from ODD folks uh, who are kind of talking about ODD work and how important it is, um, and that's on the left-hand side in the blue box. Um, so the idea that 50% of all hedge fund failures are related to operational failures. So um, that's, you know, even within the last couple of months, uh, I've seen, you know, folks kind of float that statistic when they're talking about the importance of ODD work. Um, now, on the one hand, I, I, I certainly agree that there is, uh, you know, an important part of OD, ODD work or an important part of manager selection is, in fact, ODD work. But that, that statistic comes from a paper that was written in 2003 and, and from data that had kind of predated the, the publication of that paper. So you're at 17, 18 years ago, call it two decades ago, um, and we're still, you know, I think in the ODD space, a lot of times hanging our hat on this, this somewhat stale statistic. And I kind of wonder if it's still true um, as we kind of take a look at ODD critically and what is ODD doing now versus what it was doing 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, I think that's important. Uh, I think it's important to grow. I think it's important to think about things um, in terms of the evolutionary environment here as well. Um, so on this slide, a fair amount of information, um, but I think generally there's three main drivers on the top uh, kind of row there, uh, three main drivers, you know, that have changed operationally in the last 15 to 20 years. Um, the first one would be the regulatory environment. Um, so you, again, you go back 15 years ago, uh, not sure how long um, folks who are on the call have been in the, in the industry. Um, but hedge funds, for example, in 2005, they were, they were choosing, uh, do we want to be in, registered with the SEC or not? It was an option. It was a choice. Um, and certainly for private equity or venture capital managers, it was, it was also a choice. And many of them, in fact, chose not to, um, right? So, so we all know, I think that's evolved significantly. Um, so the regulatory kind of environment has, has changed. Uh, certainly we can discuss uh, always whether, you know, groups like the SEC have, you know, kind of the, the, the focus on the right things and that kind of thing. But I think it'd be difficult to argue that there's less regulation now than there was 15, 20 years ago, particularly for private um, funds and, and hedge funds and private markets um, funds. The second piece, I think, uh, in terms of the biggest kind of number of changes has been, you know, the technology environment. Uh, certainly, you know, again, go back 15, 20 years ago when you were doing due diligence on an equity manager, you might go in and actually see paper trading tickets, if anyone remembers that, um, with physical kind of timestamps and filed away in hard copy. Um, I think if we saw that situation today, it 
but we'd be pretty critical of it. Um, so straight through kind of processing capabilities um, from everything from trade order management to execution of trades to accounting for trades, um, generally in, in a lot of different asset classes now is relatively straight through valuation processes for public securities, much more robust. So very, very significant change in the technology environment in the last 15 to 20 years. Now there's a trade off there, right? And, and a risk transfer, um, it moves away from, you know, the risks of manual errors and oversight um, in that environment, in that former environment um, to obviously things like, you know, security of your technology platform. Um, obviously the more you rely on that uh, tech platform for your day-to-day -day processing, the more important that it's up and running um, and that bad actors don't have access to it. So there's definitely a trade, but still a big change in kind of the tech environment, call it the last 15 to 20 years. And then the last piece would be internal versus external administration. So again, go back to that 2005 uh, period. You know, again, a lot of times, especially for hedge funds, and remember that's where we talked about ODD work you know, started was in the hedge fund space. Uh, but many of those managers ran the official book of record internally um, on potentially their own accounting system, potentially not an accounting system uh, on Excel spreadsheets. Um, they were making, you know, marks uh, and valuations on their own, um, sometimes with limited oversight, let alone third party kind of valuation um, tools. Uh, and, and obviously that's a big change. Um, so hedge funds, open-ended funds now almost really exclusively are using external fund administrators. Um, you know, that means it's a, a third party set of eyes on the book of record, doing the accounting, involved in cash transfers, um, involved in the valuation process. All of these kind of critical things related to portfolio accounting are generally now handled by a third party. So we think that's obviously a significantly, um, you know, better control um, than even the best internal manager accounting group uh, running the internal book uh, because of the potential for, you know, for, for fraud, for collusion, um, uh, for, for trying to kind of finesse numbers in one way, shape, or form. So those, I think, again, are the big uh, changes over the last 15 years, you know, increase in regulation, additional technology capabilities, and then the move towards external fund administration. And so, again, as we think about the world changing um, in the last 15 years, as an ODD person, I, I have to think about how, how are we doing ODD and, and why is it kind of the same um, that it was being done, you know, again, back 15 to 20 years ago? Um, and so when I think about what are the challenges in the ODD space, these are the main ones. I'm going to talk these through uh, here a little bit as well. So the first one on the left hand side is, you know, just how expansive the mandate has ultimately become. Uh, again, it really started in the hedge fund space. Um, now, our clients are expecting ODD work from other asset classes, uh, all public markets uh, strategies, you know, so traditional fixed income and equity, for example, and now the private markets as well. So venture capital, private equity, private real estate, all of those now are going through uh, an ODD process, uh, not just the hedge funds anymore. So that's the first way the mandate has expanded. The second way is just going back to that risk inventory. Um, and that, that inventory never gets smaller. Um, I mentioned earlier, it's dynamic. We're always thinking about new risks, but very rarely is there a situation where um, it's like, hey, there's these five new risk areas we need to think about, and, and here's you know, three you don't have to worry about anymore. Uh, it's really always growing. Um, and so as we think about that kind of risk inventory, um, the mandate, the complexity uh, certainly increases uh, on kind of a continual basis ultimately. One of the things I would also comment on there in terms of that expansion, a lot of it is really seen in um, the, the, the space of the alpha degenerative type risks. Um, and so that's, again, another concern in terms of how do we optimize our resources? How do we make sure we're covering those but not over allocating resources to them so that we're, we're ignoring or spending less time than we like on the more kind of catastrophic risks. So that's a big deal. And then the third way um, that ODD has expanded uh, is really from a frequency perspective. So it started uh, again initially as a pre-investment exercise. So you were, you're looking at a new manager, you're thinking of allocating to a new group. What do we do? Um, we went to a full kind of comprehensive ODD exercise. 
Um, and again, that's where the discipline started. Now it's like, okay, what are you doing every year? Or what are you doing every quarter? What is, how are we monitoring on an ongoing basis? Um, and so the, the, among those three different kind of areas that ODD work has expanded, you can kind of see this relatively geometric kind of progression, um, right? It's kind of exploding in terms of what's expected from us. And so, you know, again, from my vantage point, the question is, okay, it's gotten bigger, uh, but has it gotten better? Um, and I'm not quite sure that it has uh, in some respects. It's a little bit focused, uh, again, on relatively manual uh, subjective value judgments um, as opposed to um, things that I think are a little bit more comprehensive and sophisticated. Um, I also kind of worry about resource commitments um, to core versus non-core risks. Again, when you're asked to kind of cover more uh, and more often, uh, but you don't have necessarily the resource commitment to do that, you, you sometimes have to pick your spots. Um, and my concern there, and I see this very often with clients as they get boxed into a corner, um, sometimes it's so uh, it's so limiting that they, they almost do nothing because you know they kind of hit this this point uh, in in time where they just decide there's, everything's too expensive or, or or we don't have enough time to do it and we can't figure out where to start so it becomes almost an inertia factor for them um, so that's uh, definitely one of the concerns that I see. Uh, we'll spend a little bit of time on the middle box now, the idea of relative risk assessment. So again, let's go back to that risk inventory. Um, and, and, and let's say on average, there's 200 different risks that we are assessing. Um, you can be kind of in a room full of the smartest, you know, most experienced operational, operational risk, operational due diligence people um, ever. And, and nobody's ever going to agree on which of those risks are the most important. Um, you know, maybe able to kind of tier them or stratify them or something like that, but everybody's got their own idea of what to focus on, what's most important. Um, and I, I, I tend to kind of understand that, but I feel like uh, generally human beings, uh, and this isn't being critical of anybody kind of specifically, but we, we all have these biases. Um, so why do people tend to overweight when you're looking at a risk of two, a list of 200 operational risk factors? Um, you're going to overweight the things you know that happen to you personally. Um, if you had a manager five years ago do something um, that caused a problem, you, you're certainly going to be inclined to make sure that never happens again. Um, and I totally understand that, but that could have been an idiosyncratic event. <clears throat> and if you're overcommitting time to that specific risk area, again, it's it's not a zero sum. You're taking kind of that time and resource away from thinking about something else. Um, people tend to overweight things that they're really good at. Um, so if you have somebody who's working in an ODD capacity whose background it is, say, in compliance, you know, they may really drill into the compliance part <coughs> of the overall assessment, but are they avoiding or are they, are, are they, you know, spending less time on a more critical risk area like cybersecurity, for example? Um, and so I tend to joke, you know, a little bit about ODD reports. And for those of you on the session who've seen ODD reports, you know, the way that I think about it is, you know, what other risk report do you ever see, you know, that doesn't have normalized information, it doesn't have statistics or analytics. Um, so ODD reports tend to be a series of opinions and they're very qualitative um, and they're very uh, much potentially based on how an individual or how a specific um, consulting firm um, or team views a specific issue. <clears throat> but there's not always a lot to kind of normalize that to make sure that they're being evaluated in the right way. Um, so that's, I think, uh, the idea of relative risk assessment becomes another concern for me. One quick water break here for me. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then we'll move ahead to the, the far right, which is ODDS audit support. Um, so again, I think the ODD started as a risk discipline. But it's morphed a little bit. Um, and what I see a lot right now is people doing things that are not maybe risk-based, uh, but are based on you know, meeting kind of a regulatory guidance or meeting an internal audit requirement that maybe says, hey, <clears throat> we need to see these managers every year. Um, you know, there's nothing special about a year. Um, why is it not 14 months uh, or 10 months? And I understand that the annual cycle you know, is suitable for a lot of this stuff. And it makes sense in a lot of ways, but, but there's nothing kind of risk-based about it, particularly if you're bucketing kind of every manager into the same cadence, into the same frequency. Uh, and so again, I worry a little bit about um, what we see in terms of 
you know, coverage limitations uh, from clients from time to time, because, you know, many of them think, you know, doing something annually is, I don't know, it's either dictated to them or they think that that frequency is some kind of, uh, again, a special um, uh, term. And so they may say, we can only see a third of our managers every year and we're gonna rotate every three years or something like that. And there's very little touch point um, for almost three years uh, between one manager visit and another, for example. And that's, again, that's not based on, I think, good risk management. That's based on you know, supporting kind of some kind of an audit function that's dictating a frequency that maybe does not make sense. And so, you know, this is the same slide, but just with an additional row across the bottom, you know, I, I, I spent the last five minutes talking about my problems uh, and my challenges, but they translate to clients as well. So the more expansive our mandate is, the, the more expensive it is, um, right? So we can't be asked to cover more managers at more frequency and cover more factors um, without kind of accommodating that from a pricing perspective. Um, internally for other groups, it might be having to hire more people, um, that kind of thing. So uh, again, the more expansive our mandate, the more expensive it is. Um, you know, Relative risk assessment is, is really lends itself to subjectivity um, and potential you know, biases, either known or unknown biases in terms of what are those recommendations and how are they being made to you? How do you know the analyst that you have on your team or that you've hired um, is thinking about things in the right way and thinking about them in a kind of an objective and consistent way? Uh, the subjectivity bias concerns me an awful lot in terms of how ODD work is presented. And then again, the idea that ODD uh, is an audit support function. Uh, again, I think there's value there, but it's maybe not as valuable as uh, kind of the true risk management core kind of roots uh, that we have uh, in the discipline. Um, so again, I'll take another pause <clears throat> there just to see if there's any questions that have come through before I kind of move into uh, the next session. And I think there might be um, a question from Hank here as well. Ryan, I'm just, I released the poll for everyone. Okay, great. So yeah, there's a poll question here. I'm uh, just trying to understand, you know, how your groups uh, ultimately are covering operational due diligence uh, and monitoring. So the idea here is uh, probably most of you have exposure to third party investment managers um, and somebody is picking those managers and somebody then is probably doing some due diligence on them. So trying to get a sense of how folks uh, ultimately um, are, are handling that. <clears throat> and then Hank or Amanda, when, when we're done here with the poll, you can let me know and I can move ahead. Okay, I closed it and I'm um, sharing the results. Got it, okay, great. So it looks like a little bit of a mix there. Um, having uh, external consultants or, or internal research teams there. So thanks for that. Um, I'm gonna move ahead to the next section. Um, this is a little bit more um, thinks about, you know, again, some of the problems that we saw in the space, uh, but what, you know, how do we contemplate those? What have we done um, to hopefully uh, address some of those problems here? Um, so we'll move ahead to the next slide. Um, if we go to an operational due diligence review kind of process um, and how that's ultimately implemented, we took a look at what each kind of engagement typically looked like um, historically. Um, and generally there's, there's, there's kind of three parts of what we do. So historically in the past, um, ultimately what we have done is, uh, you know, sent out questionnaires. These are generally um, Word documents uh, you know, that have a lot of questions about how a manager is running their business. Um, those uh, questionnaires that we have could be between 30 and 40 pages long, just of questions. Um, they come back to us, they're completed, they're now maybe 70 or 80 pages long. Um, there's another couple hundred pages of documentation that go with that. Um, so on my, on my team is responsible then for assessing that information, um, scheduling follow-ups, the managers talking about problem areas, uh, chasing down um, different things, and then ultimately writing some kind of a report or a deliverable about what they have found. Um, so those three pieces, collecting information, assessing the information, and then writing uh, 
a report or a deliverable about, about it. Those, those really comprise, you know, what a typical due diligence exercise looks like. What we wanted to do was um, really focus on the middle part, the assessment. We think that's the important part. We think that's what people pay for. We think that's where the value is in, in terms of what we do, the subject matter expertise. So we wanted to preserve or maybe even expand the amount of time we have available to assess information, uh, but ultimately um, spend less time collecting it and less time kind of writing reports about it. Um, and so what we did about 24 months ago um, through a platform we call ODDIQ. Um, IQ stands for Identify and Quantify. So we moved to a digitized questionnaire and we now database all of the responses that we get from investment managers who are answering these questions. And from that database then we can ultimately create some automated reporting um, that includes things like comparative analytics and we can kind of look at how uh, a manager's response compares ultimately to others. So it provides an objective and data-driven kind of benchmarking and risk reporting framework. Um, so that's ultimately kind of the core of what we have um, tried to accomplish and tried to build out just this ODDIQ platform. And the idea <clears throat> here is, you know, again, to create something that's, you know, thinks about the expense. Um, you know, through automated reporting, for example, we have the ability to uh, conduct ODD reviews and analysis uh, in a way that we think is far more kind of affordable uh, potentially for our clients and certainly for us internally. So we, we, we're spending less money, uh, less resources on the administrative elements of what we do. Um, so, you know, we can kind of do what we do for, for a lower cost. Um, from the subjectivity standpoint, um, this is one thing I like to emphasize, you know, the, there's still a qualitative component very much so to ODD work. There always will be. It's a very important part of it. Um, but we're trying to complement that with an, a normalized kind of data-driven framework that lets us look at risks in a, in a normalized way. Um, and that eventually, uh, essentially allows us to, to conduct a more sophisticated analysis of risk factors that really have been only subjective, only qualitative in the past. Um, and then from a risk, uh, risk driven standpoint, you know, again, we want to facilitate a risk based approach uh, to operational due diligence to monitoring exercises, we want to find an affordable way um, to kind of, kind of drive and optimize the resource allocations to what we're doing. Um, we've got a couple of slides here now um, to, to think about in terms of, okay, what does a data driven approach look like? Um, so, for example, um, on the left hand side, um, there's certain things that will kind of be generated uh, from a manager reporting standpoint. So if a manager says um, they're not doing something that we want them to do, ultimately, we're able to kind of track that and where do they fall from a quartile standpoint relative to other managers within your own portfolio, um, relative to the universe as a whole. Um, and that takes advantage of our scale. We've got like 400 managers in the database already in between eight and 900 um, different strategies. We can uh, kind of track each risk item. There's about 175 factors that we pick up right now. We can, we can um, track them through an inventory approach. So you can see where a manager is meeting expectations and where there maybe are some deficiencies. Um, on the right hand side, these are some examples of portfolio level reporting. Um, so again, having uh, managers onboarded into uh, the overall kind of data system allows us to kind of look at the portfolio as a whole. So let's say in the middle of the page, you're worried or you're concerned about what levels of you know, insurance, errors, errors and emissions insurance a manager has. You can actually see, you know, number one, do they have it, but how does it compare um, to the coverage levels of other managers within your portfolio? Um, so if you have concerns about those managers that are, you know, carrying less than $5 million or less than $1.5 million in coverage, you can actually see kind of who they are. Um, it's everything on the lower um, middle there uh, to rec reconciliation frequency. So uh, again, how often are managers reconciling cash accounts, um, reconciling the positions in the portfolio, or doing a full tri-party rep to the administrator? Does that happen daily, weekly, monthly, or quarterly, for example? Um, so here's, uh, again, metrics that allow you to kind of understand. So if you see a manager um, that is only doing something monthly um, and you want, you know, something you think they should be doing daily, you can actually see in the cash accounts that they're only wrecking cash once a month, you know, they're in the lowest 5% um, relative to peers. Um, so it gives you the gravitas to not just understand that there's a risk, 
but to go back to that manager and say, hey, um, these are some things that, you know, that the market is doing and, and, and you're not up to speed, what's going on here? So it's a way to kind of identify risk, quantify it from a relative or a comparable uh, analytics perspective, and then find ways with the manager ultimately to remediate that work. Here's a couple of other samples. I've got two, a couple more pages here. Um, you know, this is something we put together um, for a, a client or a prospect. It was a public pension plan. They have exposure to about 80 different managers. Um, we had uh, actually coverage of about 40 of them already uh, within the platform. So about half their portfolio um, that because we have live data and analytics capabilities with the push of a button, for example, we could generate, you know, these diagnostic statistics. So on the left-hand side, um, you know, we have manager sorting. So we can see, you know, these are the, the isolated idiosyncratic risks. So keep in mind, this is a 40 manager portfolio, um, 3%, which is actually two and a half rounded up. Um, so that's one manager out of 40, for example, you know, acknowledges it's not doing background checks of new employees in the regulatory history. Um, so again, a situation where 39 of your managers are doing that, you've got one that isn't. Um, to me, that's a relatively easy win. Uh, to be able to kind of work with that manager to make sure that they're integrating that as part of their process um, to de-risk uh, your exposure to, again, some kind of a bad regulatory history event uh, with a given employee. So on the left-hand side, those are examples of, call it idiosyncratic risks. On the right-hand side, those um, are, are the opposite sort. That's your pockets of risk. So here you have 70% of managers in that 40 manager portfolio. Um, they're not doing any kind of formal key uh, service provider rebidding. Um, so you may have the same, I don't know, audit firm for 10 years. Um, fees may have compressed, service levels may have changed. You may be losing a few basis points on cost um, because you're not rebidding kind of that business on a periodic basis. So that's an exposure ultimately that clients you know, would pay for. Um, so here we see 70% of that portfolio has that specific kind of risk item. The whole idea here is again, using kind of statistics and analytics and the data-driven model um, to sometimes reinforce what we think about qualitatively. Sometimes it actually, you know, it teaches us something. Sometimes the data tells us something It's a little bit different than how we might have thought about it. And, and that's, I think, a natural evolution for a purely qualitative discipline uh, to ultimately start thinking about uh, things in that kind of more uh, normalized fashion. Um, the other, I, I guess, point I would make is if we think about risk management, investment risk management, you know, there's always an effort to understand how, how does that look at the portfolio level? You don't just look at kind of, you, know, you do look at one individual manager and their risk management policies, procedures, what they're doing, what their statistics look like, but you also want to aggregate that and understand it at the portfolio level. That's the whole idea here is can we, through data and analytics, understand what our exposures are, not just to an individual manager, but do I have a pocket of risk in, in, in my portfolio? And then my kind of my last slide here um, is just, you know, it's some general statistics. It's a little bit um, out of date from earlier this year at that point, about 330 firms, over 700 strategies in the database. Um, but again, we're noting here that 92% of firms had at least one cyber, cyber risk flag identified and 82% had up to five. Um, so if we think about cybersecurity as a big risk area, I know a lot of folks are focused on it, you know, here's a way to kind of, you know, start to quantify that. What does my exposure look like? Uh, what does it mean? How can I get managers to buy into remediating certain cybersecurity policies and procedures, you know, to, so that I can, I, I can kind of cover that risk off? Um, so those are different, you know, kind of ways that we think about it. These are different ways that we kind of aggregate and think about the, the, the data and information that we're collecting. Um, so we're still you know, going out to see managers, we're still kind of writing reports, um, although we have a good head start uh, because our automated system uh, does a lot of that writing for us. So my, my, the folks on my team, the goal uh, for us is to move ODD away from being kind of report writers and more to being risk managers. Um, so that we're actively in a position to identify risks, um, to help to quantify them uh, in a way that we can understand them and prioritize risk reduction, and then spend the bulk of our time uh, really on risk reduction strategies, again, as opposed to um, writing reports. Uh, so I've got a few more slides here um, that we can, um, that if, if folks are provided the slides, you can look at it. It's a little bit more about me and my team, so I'm going to kind of leave it at this for now.
we've got about 10 minutes left. I understand there may be a couple of questions um, that have come in. So I just uh, I'll take a kind of uh, a, a pause here. Uh, we'll wrap up the slides and uh, we'll move into the Q&A. Great, thank you, Ryan. Um, so Ryan, as you know, the audience, uh, you know, here are MCPERS members, which are public sector pension plans, you know, public agencies. Um, in your estimation, because they're public agencies, do, do they run any sort of additional risk? And if so, uh, how, does, um, how does that compare to your other clients? And does your ODD differ because there may be additional risk for public sector pension plans? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, you know, there are certain, I would say there's certain types of risks that are probably a little bit more, um, you know, uh, pension related, um, but the majority of them are, are really kind of client agnostic um, in terms of the types of things that we uh, consider. Look, you know, nobody wants, a, you know, one of our managers to have some kind of a cyber event. Um, nobody wants one of their managers to have a bad service provider. Um, nobody um, wants to have exposure to a key person about it. So I think I would say in, in general, uh, many of them are the same. I think where we see a little bit more uptake, a little bit more appetite uh, for ODD um, in the pen space ties to that fiduciary responsibility. Um, so if you think of, um, I don't know, in contrast, maybe a family office, uh, for example, you know, we still think operational due diligence, operational monitoring is, is best practice. Um, it's critical. It's a good thing to do, but there's not kind of any kind of a regulator um, or a guidance that says you have to do this. Um, on the fiduciary side, you do have uh, recommendations promulgated um, that, you know, again, suggest as a good fiduciary, um, you should be doing this um, and you should be doing it pre-investment, but you also should be monitoring on an ongoing basis. So it's kind of a little bit of a weird one where the, the risk falls a little bit more to, um, you know, the plan sponsor um, or its designates, right? Um, as opposed to, to, to that, that's where the risk kind of inflection comes in maybe a little bit more um, because you do have a fiduciary responsibility to be thinking about and considering these types of risks not just the investment side stuff. So I think that's where we see maybe a little bit more of a positional shift uh, between folks on the pension side versus maybe some other client types that we interact with. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, in terms of on-site due diligence, um, do you still recommend it uh, given where we are still relative to the pandemic? Well, yeah, I think there's two parts of the question. You know, what's 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 the current environment and what's the ideal state? And I think, you know, again, it'd be tough to argue that anyone's in an ideal state right now, um, although it does seem to have gotten better, hopefully, um, for, for certain parts of the world in the last few months. Um, look, look uh, here's the way that I think about that. Um, On-site due diligence is important. It's critical. It's never going to go away. And absolutely, if you are, you know, if it's a manager that's new to you, you've never been to their office before, or your consultant has never been to their office before, or you haven't had, you know, conversations, um, personal conversations, you know, while looking each other in the eye, um, you're trying to do a cultural assessment, um, you, you know, those things aren't really replaceable, even, you know, through some of the things that we're trying to um, introduce, the data and analytics um, portions. Uh, maybe arguably they are in some ways, but for the most part, you should still be going to see a manager on a pre-investment basis. Um, where I guess I, I struggle a little bit is if you've been invested with a manager for five years and you've been to, you know, spend all the money to go to their office and visit them four years in a row, is that really a good spend in the, in the fifth year? Are you getting enough out of those kind of ongoing meetings? Or are there ways that you can allocate those resources to having better coverage of different managers that maybe you haven't seen? So that's where I think a lot of, um, you know, the bill to, uh, for us is coming, it, is thinking about optimizing resources um, and understanding that, look, the most expensive thing that we do is spend a day in a manager's office, right? You've got the, the T&E and then you've got the, um, just the time commitment. And it's a big time commitment for the managers as well. Um, I think there's ways that you can optimize that. I think you don't need to go see that manager every year or multiple 
multiple times per year. I think you can sequence that and you can do certain things. There's a heck of a lot of, of information about a manager and how they run their business that you can find through a questionnaire, through a phone conversation. Um, and the idea here is, is to create a framework ultimately that extracts that type of information in a very, very efficient way. So that when you do go on site, you've got an agenda, you know, you've got, you, you've got this report that says, hey, here's 10 things um, that you're, you're not doing that 80% of your competitors or your peers are. Let's talk about this. Now you have something to talk about. Um, you have, you know, ways that you can kind of push and, and, and work with that manager to, to remediate some of that stuff. So again, if you're kind of going for the meet and greet, um, you know, there is value to that. There's always going to be a cultural assessment, a qualitative assessment in terms of ODD work. But if you've got bosses like mine, that most people do, where you have to kind of explain and rationalize how you're kind of optimizing resources, you know, the idea here is, is that's not always, that, that most expensive resource is not always the best one. There's a lot of things that you can do remotely. And uh, I think that probably the world is going to move in that direction a little bit along with us. Right. Can, can we stick with this uh, theme of on-site and how best to uh, utilize it? And actually, I guess, shifting gears slightly and going back to my first question about, you know, the, the audience members here who are public sector plans. And as public sector plans, they're public agencies. And in some instances, unfortunately, they, in my opinion, unfairly get raked over the coals for, you know, due diligence uh, visits and trips. You know, so, you know, if, if you've been paying attention, there, there is particularly recently um, um, a statewide uh, pension plan that uh, has about 65 billion AUM, uh, but, you know, the local media is raking them over the coals for having $500,000 worth of expenditures to visit managers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, Given what you just said about the need for due diligence, and, and again, you know, assuming that, you know, this, again, this is a $65 billion uh, pension plan, very sophisticated, and, not, you know, the, 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 the visits and the due diligence trips are necessary. How would you advise a client like that when, when they seem to be, you know, being unfairly targeted for a $500,000 spend versus a $65 billion assets under management, which I don't even know what the math is in terms of, yeah, right? It's just, it's just so insignificant. But yeah, if they were a client of yours, what would you tell them? Yeah, and I think that's, that's a great example. For this. So number one, um, I think you're probably never gonna win that argument with a local journalist who thinks that $500,000 is on an absolute basis is a lot of money and isn't thinking about it on a relative basis or what you're getting for that. Um, but again, I do think there are ways to like take advantage of that situation to think about optimizing what your cadence is. Uh, again, if it's a new manager, you don't know, you've never you know, physically been in their office, I think we're always gonna recommend uh, going on site or hiring somebody to go on site to do that ultimately for you. Um, but again, I do think, uh, I don't know if you've got exposure to, to a large institutional firm like BlackRock, I do think it's hard to justify, you know, a couple thousand dollars a year, you know, to fly someone there to spend a day in their office. He, you, you know, you're, you're, you're going to learn things. Um, you're going to be able to talk to their folks. But I think a lot of what you need to capture um, to, you know, demonstrate operational monitoring of, of a firm like that, you, you, you can do a different way. That's less kind of resource intensive. Um, right. And so I pick on BlackRock a lot just because everyone knows them and they're, they're the biggest. Um, but, you know, in, in a typical institutional or pension portfolio, you might have 15, 20, 30 managers of that profile. Um, you know, that's relatively easy win in terms of cost reduction and thinking about how are we going to monitor um, these large kind of institutional partners that we have um, and really focus our time on the smaller um, niche strategies or boutique settings or groups that we don't know. You know, the other comment I would have, this actually just came out of a discussion I had recently. Um, you know, I have uh, uh, one, one client that we're working with. Um, it's a little bit less in terms of AUM, uh, but a pretty, you know, sophisticated group. 
they have a background check budget of 1.5 million per year. And that's not for their employees, that's to do background checks on the investment managers um, that they are looking at allocating money to. Um, and so clearly, you know, that, that's, that, that's a lot. That's a really, that's you know, a big chunky uh, resource commitment that they're making there. Um, this is also a group that does spend a lot of time on site with managers. And so, you know, they're clearly not, um, you know, kind of under resourcing uh, elements of ODD there, but just, you know, to think that their, their background check uh, budget is 3X, um, call it the travel budget uh, of, of, of a plan like that, I think is telling, um, right? I think there's always groups that are, um, you know, again, looking at what do we spend our money on and is a background check, you know, more valuable uh, way to spend that money than an on-site visit. Um, I think there's always going to be times when, when the answer to that is different. Um, but ultimately, I think you can pick your spots. I think you can find some you know, relatively easy wins and still do what you need to do from a monitoring perspective without necessarily getting on a plane every time. Ryan Aki, thank you so much for your time and your expertise. Uh, we really enjoyed your presentation today. And to our members who tuned in, thank you so much. Uh, we are going to be taking a hiatus in terms of our webcast for the balance of the summer, and we look forward to seeing you again in September. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Hank. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, everyone. Bye now.